Hello and welcome to the new season of Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. We've all heard that music is good for the soul, but have you ever considered music as medicine? On tonight's show, we'll learn more about how you can use the healing power of music to fight depression and addiction, to help with pain relief, and overcome your overall quality of life. I'm so pleased to welcome a multi-talented and absolutely fascinating panel of guests tonight. First, I'd like to welcome M. Greiner. She's a Juno-nominated musician and vocal coach who toured with David Bowie. She's performed on Saturday Night Live, and she's helped make the first music video in outer space. M is also the author of The Healing Power of Singing, Raise Your Voice, Change Your Life, What Touring with David Bowie, Single Parenting, and Ditching the Music Business Taught Me in 25 Easy Steps. Next, I'm so pleased to welcome Stephen Flynn, a former forest monk who now teaches music to students across North America who have special needs, including autism and Down syndrome. Stephen uses rhythms, percussion, and the piano to teach academic concepts, positive communication, and social skills. He's been teaching for more than 25 years and is also an international recording artist who has appeared on over 40 releases and regularly tours Europe, the United States, and Japan. And last but not least, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Andrew Rossetti, a New York-based medical music psychotherapist. He's a clinician, educator, researcher, and supervisor of the Louis Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine's Music Psychotherapy Program in Radiation Oncology at Mount Sinai. Dr. Rossetti is a frequent lecturer at international conferences and universities, and his work has been featured extensively on media outlets across North America. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. You all have such a fascinating background that I think it's essential we start with a little bit of your life story and what led you to this line of work. Emma, why don't we start with you? Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I really have lived a life of music. It's been very up and down. I began just loving writing songs and that was my fuel for everything. I wanted to sing those songs. Uh, I wanted to get a record deal. And uh, my path has been uh, a lot of trial and error, to be honest. And um, it's led me to this place of I'm a mom now. I also am continuing to record and release music. And I have my book out, which just came out. So um, in a nutshell, it's uh, been an independent music musician's life, but also uh, the life of a parent. And um, just really happy to be here. And I apologize in advance. I know you're, you're sick and tired of being asked this question. And I know because I read this in your book, but I have to ask, what was it like touring with David Bowie? And what did he teach you about the power of music and sound? That's a great question. I went into singing with David Bowie um, unexpectedly. I had been dropped from a record deal and just floating around New York. Our other panelists are from New York. Um, and I miss it so much there. Um, and I met him at a time when he was very happy in his life and we were performing all his big hits. And I think what I took away from him is that you can do music for such a long time. You know, he was in his fifties um, and really discovering new things uh, through being in the, in the moment, really. He wasn't really um, a big, like there are some artists who really love to talk about their past all the time and their the seventies and the eighties. And he was very much in the moment. So I took that away that, you know, you can be a big legend, but you can also be, um, very humble and still creative and excited about music. And he taught me to focus on my own music, which is funny because, you know, you join someone's band and it's often all about them. So that was a big takeaway. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Em. It's, it's not every day that you can say that you had a mentor like that uh, in your career. I'd now like to turn the conversation over to Stephen. And I know that you had quite a rough start in life. From when we were chatting on the phone, you were telling me all about it, but it's it's very humbling and inspiring uh, that you overcame it all, and here you are to, to tell the tale. So take us through your journey. Um, well, it's been interesting. Um, I guess in terms of the healing power of music, um, I started playing professionally in my teens, 
and uh, had a number of opportunities up to my early 20s, but my drug addiction pretty much took all that away. Um, I was fortunate enough to get clean in 1984 and uh, at the age of 22. And that's really when I look at when my life and healing really started as, and my growth as a person. Um, when you're a drug addict, um, at least I started using very, very young, um, your emotional growth stops. And when I got clean, that's really when I started growing as a person. And, uh, you know, when you get clean, uh, one of the things that differentiates us from animals is our ability to choose what we focus in on. And in terms of music, it was really positive because it gave me the opportunity to focus in on something really positive and take a lot of that energy that I put into my addiction into something positive and, and that I was very passionate about. And I, I, I really firmly believe that if you have passion in one area of your life, you're very likely to have a positive spillover into other areas of your life. And that's indirectly what led me to working with special needs people. And I've been doing that for quite some time. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity. And Stephen, you also work with a lot of at risk and incarcerated youth as well. Do you ever recognize yourself in them? Um, Yes and no, um, but I will say that uh, my background has given me, a, I believe, a lot more empathy in working with these populations. Mm. Yeah, very good point. Thank you so much for sharing. And now I'd like to turn the conversation over you, over to you, Andrew. I'd love to hear more about what a music therapist does and what made you to pursue this career. I'll be honest, before uh, my team and I started researching the show, I had never even heard of music therapy. Talk us through what that what that involves. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me on uh, today. Thrilled to be here. Uh, music therapy. Music therapy is a as a profession has been around uh, since the, the World War II when uh, uh, they started uh, bringing musicians into the uh, wards where shell shocked. Um, Veterans were shell shock was what they used to call PTSD, and uh, uh, music therapy has developed into a uh, profession uh, where there is a uh, great deal of of uh, preparation and learning that takes place. Uh, we start off with uh, bachelor's degrees through masters and uh, PhD and and uh, postdocs, and uh, uh, we uh, practice as as board certified. In, in the U.S. as licensed uh, professionals as well. So what a, what a therapist does, well, we, we use uh, music in a therapeutic process uh, that often involves uh, therapeutic relationship. Uh, uh, any, any number of uh, problems or issues that people have, uh, my area of expertise is working in, uh, in medicine, music and medicine, and so uh, I spend uh, much of my waking time uh, tending to patients in oncology and working with them using music therapy and, and psychotherapy to help them uh, deal with, with symptoms uh, from their illnesses or symptoms from treatment itself. I'm curious, Andrew, because although we're talking about how music played the fundamental role in connecting with ourselves, it obviously is huge in connecting with others. And when you're working in a hospital clinical setting and, and often with palliative care patients who are at the end of their lives, does using music make it more difficult for you to stay detached? More difficult for me to stay detached, no. Um, I, I don't think detachment is is uh, something that a, that a uh, therapist uh, uh, strives for, but, but you know, to see and actually connecting with with uh, our patients, connecting with people that we're we're trying to help with that final transition. So you know, one of the things that makes music such a wonderful clinical tool is that that music can often express things or go places where where words can't. We're, we are trained in, in uh, verbal psychotherapy as well. Uh, uh, it's the music and its metaphoric content, uh, its ability to represent significant things for people that actually 
makes it into such a, um, a great, great modality, uh, as you're saying, in, in palliative care. So the answer is um, music doesn't help me stay detached. Music helps me become more involved in that process of working with a person who's transitioning out of life. So can you give us an example of, of you know, an, an exercise you might go through or uh, music that you might use in helping with uh, helping a patient who's at the end of their life? Uh, sure. I just happen to have a guitar here with me. And well, fantastic. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that is uh, very, very common, of course, uh, is anxiety. In, in that context. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a really brief snippet of, uh, of a uh, sort of protocolized intervention that we would do. It would probably last about 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna give you a tiny little sound bite of it. And uh, it has to do with using um, a, a technique, not just passive listening to music, but a little bit of, uh, of an induction. And uh, we're gonna do some uh, breath focus as well. Okay. So I am going to pretend that you are my patient, Barbara, if that's okay, and direct sure. this towards you. Okay. If I, uh, ideally, I would be able to be able to observe. I would try and synchronize that or entrain is the, the word that we use and train to your breathing and modify that. I can't quite see your breathing, so I'm going to pretend that I can, right? So just to start off, I'm gonna invite you to focus on the sound of the instrument for a bit. invite you to close your eyes and let's start off with a deep breath this is comfortable for you exhale when you need to and when you're ready one more big deep breath this time and a long slow exhale like breathing out through a straw long and slow long and slow okay. Larry's focus on your breathing on the physical sensations, what it feels like when you breathe in and out. This isn't an exercise, so you don't have to try and breathe in any special way now. Just breathe as your body is asking you to. And allowing yourself to focus ever more deeply on your breathing. And if you do that, likely you become aware of some very subtle physical sensations, almost if they were serious in advance. And you probably notice when you draw breath, is the sensation of air flowing into your lungs and your lungs expanding. Allow yourself to focus on that very subtle, natural physical sensation. Air flowing in and air flowing out. So I would invite the patient to focus more and more deeply on their breathing and bring them to hopefully a much more relaxed state. Well, I can tell you that worked like a charm on me. Uh, we have to go to commercial break soon, but thank you very much for sharing that with us. We'll be right back with more after this. Hi, welcome back to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. And on tonight's show, we're talking about using the healing power of music to overcome depression, addiction, and change your life for the better. I want to start the conversation by going back to M. In your book, you mentioned that many artists don't even get their big break or even don't get started until they're in their 30s and 40s. And 
certainly was the case for you that you didn't start out singing as a child. You weren't necessarily a, a child prodigy. Talk to us about how music can be for everybody and maybe some of the transformations you've seen in your work with people from all walks of life who come to you wanting to learn how to improve their voice. Sure. Um, I worked with a woman who came to me for vocal lessons and we started, we sang for, well, she's quite shy to sing at first. And, and I understand that quite a bit. I really understand that because I was shy as a kid and I didn't want to sing in front of people, which is really odd. But um, one of the things I ask people to do is really visualize <clears throat> their ultimate musical life. Um, because when you're further down the road in life, we've obviously got a lot of responsibilities, sometimes obstacles to dreaming big. And it's really hard unless someone kind of is partnering with you to give you the license and permission to dream that dream, to uh, kind of put it into words. Or in this case, I wanted her to make a vision board. Um, so through doing this exercise, which is a really popular exercise, but people do have different responses to it. She, um, she and I found our sessions to be not about singing at all, but her willingness to go to the place where she could like make sound with her body, um, cracked something open in her and she ended up healing all kinds of stuff in her life. Uh, talking about things that she had buried. And um, so the, the vocal lessons were like a gateway to this self-exploration for her. And I find that it's so, it's across the board, like, you know, Dr. Rossetti is talking about breath. And I think when we are uh, challenged or inspired to use our breath, it unlocks so much. And I think there's a real correlation there between breath and the ability to change and music is in there in the middle of that. And, and you yourself, um, you grew up on a farm. You didn't really get into singing and songwriting until much later in life. What made you unlock your voice? Um, well, it wasn't a total farm. It was a chicken. We had a couple of chickens, <laughs> but in my book, it sounds like I lived on a farm. I think it was the fact that I, I felt like there was isolation in my childhood. Uh, I felt a great degree of loneliness. Um, and music was that vehicle to escape, whether it was listening to it. And then when I realized I had the ability to write, then that was a whole other uh, liberating aspect of living. So, um, it was just the love for songwriting and the fact that, you know, wow, like I hear all these songs on the radio and I could make one. The, the possibility of, of, you know, being in that world really propelled me into all the other things like, you know, trying to get a record deal, being in the music business, leaving the music business and all of that. And you also talk in your book about how you went through a, a really hard time in your life during your divorce and went through a period of depression and, you know, thought about sort of hanging up your, your music career altogether. How did music kind of bring you back to, to your center again? How did it help you heal through such a hard time? Yes, uh, it's a good question. I think when really traumatic things happen to you, we all have different responses, but my response was to uh, really shut down and, and go into some self-sabotaging uh, habits. But what happened was I was asked to be in a play where I had to sing 30 Joni Mitchell songs for six weeks. <laughs> and I thought to myself at the time, like, wow, this is great. I really want to sing about like love, loss and the female experience nonstop for for uh, six weeks while my life is falling apart. But um, it was actually a blessing because it pulled me out of that dark time. There were people expecting me to be on stage. They wanted me to sing Joni Mitchell in a way that, you know, she didn't even sing it. And I didn't want to let anyone down. And I do love the theater. So it really brought me out of it. And I think when you have that community around you, um, 
it's so vital when you're in a dark time uh, because we all want to kind of shut down or at least I did and um, having that around me was was uh, so important to my healing and so even when I'm not in like I'm quite happy now I really make sure that I'm surrounded by people who lift my energy and who you know you know, I just came back from Nashville and made an amazing record. And that's another testament of, you know, the power of being around people who make music at a certain level and can nurture you and see you for who you really are. There's really something to be said about being in sync with a group of people and music is only one of the languages that we can use to, to communicate with others. But I want to go back to, to Stephen. You have had no shortage of traumatic events in your past. And of course, you, you've been sober for more than 40 years. I know part of that journey included a stint as, as a monk in Thailand. Talk us through how music helped you heal at some of the, the darkest points in your life and, and the role it still plays for you today. Uh, just to clarify, I've been clean uh, almost 38 years. Um, not quite 40, but I'm working on it. Um, you know, uh, one of the things about music that um, has become more and more apparent to me over the years is that music is a great vehicle for changing my physiology. And when I change my physiology, my thoughts change. And that's something I've noticed over the years. Uh, several years ago, I was working uh, in London, uh, doing a lot of spontaneous improvisation gigs. And I was working with this octogenarian and I watched her body language. And then I watched her body language when she got on stage, her whole body opened up and there was this complete transformation and I'm, my experience with teaching for so many years is that when you change how you move your body, whether you're playing a saxophone, whether you're playing drums, whether you're singing, you're going to be changing your physiology. And that's going to have a direct influence on your thoughts and put you in a more resourceful state for healing. So um, music, um, particularly drums, you know, you really have to ch you change your physiology drumming. Um, you know, I was directly affected by 9-11, and uh, I had a lot of adversity that year. It was very, very painful. And one of the things I did, I, I ended up leaving New York City and going back to Los Angeles. And one of the things I started doing was I started boxing in this gym in East, La East L.A. And uh, what I found was that uh, boxing really changed, you know, it's a very, you know, physical activity, and it really helped me uh, with the, the depression that I was going through. And, you know, you, it's a, when you're boxing, that's a real dramatic shift in your physiology. Um, when I work with, I, I work with roughly anywhere from 26 to 30 special needs students a week online. I use an alternative notation system to teach them piano. The notes have colors, and I also teach drum set. Um, and when, when I'm working with my students, we frequently take breaks and I have them stand up, put their hands on their hip like Superman and stand there for two minutes and breathe. And then I have them get back on their instrument and there's a complete transformation as well. So I hope I answered your question with that. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. What are some of the biggest transformations that you've seen in your students with special needs? Have you ever uh, gotten a student who is nonverbal to start talking or communicating with you? I prefer to say not yet verbal because so mm. many students are, you know, over time will become limited verbal and then verbal. Um, and so my experience has been when I approach a student, I approach them as if they can do every exercise. Uh, for four years, I was in the largest special needs high school in Los Angeles. I did three ensembles a day for four years. And I remember once I had uh, the student, Jose, he had never spoken in his life. And I went up to him and I said, what's your name? And he went to the drum and said, Jose. So you never wow. know. Wow, I just I just got chills down my spine. I want to hear more about that, but first I want to ask Dr. Andrew, what are some of the most profound changes or transformations you've seen 
in your hospital and clinical setting? Have you have you ever been surprised? I I imagine you've seen it all during your career, but you probably have moments where the power of music still uh, takes you aback. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, just to uh, uh, piggyback on on what uh, Stephen was saying about uh, how how music works is that you know the, this idea of of uh, changing your your physiology through music, and um, it, at this point, you know, there's there's little doubt in the scientific community that the that the mind and body are not separate things, but actually one interactive and integrated gestalt. And so, um, music can can very much, very very easily affect movement and, and affect the person's physiology. And when it does that, it's also directly affecting their, their psyche. So where the, where the, the uh, body goes, the mind follows and, and vice versa. In about uh, uh, transformation um, in the hospital, I think that, that um, amazing things that I've, I've been privileged uh, to experience is, is the, the incredible transformation of uh, people receiving uh, treatment for cancer, specifically uh, radiation therapy for cancer, and how they are able through working uh, in, with music psychotherapy to channel their, their inner resilience and to change a, a situation where they are, are very, very diversely affected post-traumatic stress, to be able to, to change that experience into post-traumatic growth. Through, uh, through music therapy. You make a, a very powerful case for the role of music in building resilience. And I wanna hear more about that and some examples from M. Griner's own personal uh, career in life as a musician. But first we have to go to break. We'll be right back after this, don't go away. Welcome back to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. And on tonight's show, we are chatting with a terrific panel of guests on how the healing power of music can help you fight a broad variety of ailments and bring more happiness and fulfillment to your life. Dr. Rossetti, before we went to break, we were talking a little bit about the nature of the work that you do in a hospital setting. And of course, uh, the work that you do serves the unique healthcare needs of, of a range of patients, uh, ranging from Alzheimer's to cancer to asthma to heart disease, uh, even to emotional and physical difficulties of performing artists and musicians. Can you talk us through the different types of music therapy that are available and how it might be tailored to the specific group of patients? Uh, sure. Well, uh... You know, music uh, in and of itself is is just such a powerful uh, um, something that that affects the entire human organism, and uh, in that sense, it's actually quite easy to use music to tailor uh, interventions for for specific issues. So, for instance, if we had uh, someone you mentioned, someone with with uh, aphasia, who might have had a stroke and uh, suffering uh, aphasia, lack of being able to uh, to find words or, or to use words. And so our techniques, for instance, like something called melodic intonation therapy that, uh, that has been shown by clinical research to be very effective in helping people uh, with aphasia to regain speech. Um, music is also a very powerful motivator for movement. So, in the sense, if you were if you were working with uh, a patient who was in uh, physical rehab, for instance, uh, someone. No, oh, I think your uh, uh, very, very screen potent. is. Oh, there you go. Oh, we got we we you froze for a second, uh, oh. but we got you back. Would you mind repeating what you just said in the last few seconds? Oh. Yes, absolutely. So about uh, uh, using music as a as a stimulant for uh, for movement, and then um, you know uh, I I guess this could be a really big answer. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and keep it as short as I can. But uh, for instance, working with uh, 
um, inpatients. Um, oh, I think, uh, oh, you froze again. We lost you. Okay, I'm going to, uh, sorry, we lost you again. So you were talking about music playing. So I was talking about, right, what, perhaps one last example uh, would be about uh, working with inpatients uh, here at the hospital where we might uh, use music in a, in a uh, therapeutic um, context and a therapeutic relationship to help people uh, work through uh, sleep disruption or pain management. So the, the good thing about music is tailored to the individual needs of patients, clients, or people, right? Because not everybody that uh, receives music therapy is a patient in the hospital. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for going through all of that. I wanna shift gears and, and go back to M. Andrew mentioned earlier in the show, the very powerful concept of resilience and the important role that music plays in building resilience. And in your book, M, you describe how you had to take a self-defense class. And in doing so, you also rediscover the power of sound um, and in, in dealing with a uh, abusive uh, stalker fan that you had, talk to us about your experience, why you had to take that class and, and what you learned about yourself as a result. Sure. Um, in, I guess it was maybe early 2000s, I was experiencing um, a great deal of communication from an individual who, um, was abusive and you know wrote me a lot of um, abusive letters. It was difficult for me as a young person because I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. He had also made threats of blowing up buildings and things like that, which we took very seriously. And they're all New York based, so we contacted authorities in New York and things like that. So, you know, my response to that was to um, not really engage with that person, but to do what I felt were, was going to be important for me, which was to find some way to fight back if needed. As a young artist, there would be a lot of like loading in and out of clubs um, by myself often. Um, and, you know, whether it's, it's obviously a larger conversation, but for me at that time, what I wanted to do, it wasn't a class I had to take, it was a class I wanted to take. Uh, I took a self-defense class called Impact, and this was in um, very much like Stephen, after 9-11, I moved to LA. Um, and I took the class in the Valley, and it was a really empowering experience to be around other women, each of us with our own stories, difficulties, experiences and what i found with that class in addition to the community was just the physiology uh as we've been talking about um the the able the ability to release um through movement and i'll obviously learn all the skills you need to learn to defend yourself but through making sound that's where the revelation was for me so if i would execute an attack uh, practice attack, um, it would never be as powerful unless it was paired with sound. So they teach you to yell no at the top of your lungs or the bottom, actually more rooting down kind of thing. Whatever it work, whatever works for you to uh, sort of supercharge that movement. Um, it was it was one of the first introductions for me. I mean, obviously, music had been empowering me all along, but just even the idea of breath and sound being so vital in, in that situation um, was really interesting for me. Also, when I wrote my book, it was one of the key things that I was just like, yeah, that was a really important aspect of sound and breath um, as, an, a, a, as something to empower us and strengthen us. Um, I also... For me, the most powerful uh, part of your book was reading about how you gave a concert after you had that self-defense class and after you had discovered the power of sound. And after many years, your your fan, your, your stalker, just shows up in the audience. 
And you never saw him again after that. Somehow your discovery of sound was not just therapeutic and allowed you to build resilience, but it, it also made you a, a better singer. And was there, was there something about your energy, your vibes that you were giving off that night, do you think, that sort of made him vanish into, into the abyss? How do you explain that? Um, well, I, I was lucky in that situation that there was nothing further that happened. Um, but in that case, I had done all the work uh, he had kind of disappeared from my life, but he uh, had just shown up at this club in Philadelphia. And um, he was wearing like sunglasses and, you know, he just plopped himself down in the audience about two or three rows back. And I recalled what I learned in that self-defense class as I sang. And it really helped me overcome any fear. And I write in the book about how I was able to just sing and actually look him raise as you know he's wearing sunglasses but I'm just like looking at him and I wasn't afraid and something about the music gave me that strength in that moment and I I didn't hear from him again um but I don't think it was anything special that you know I it, I think I just we find uh power in music in a variety of different scenarios and in that case, um, I think I just found it in myself and in that moment. A lot of those themes of reclaiming power and also tapping into your potential, it really resonates with a lot of what Stephen said earlier on in the show. Stephen, when you gave that example of the student who had been nonverbal up until that point, you saw something in him that perhaps no one else had. You know, I'd really love to to dive further into that. Talk to us about how you've used rhythms and specifically West African rhythms to work with autistic students. And you know, what what kind of keeps you showing up for work every day? Is it is it moments like those? Well, there's a number of questions there. One of the things that um, really drives a lot of my work is that, you know, when I got clean, I had a gentleman, he tugged on my coat and he said, you know, you don't have to have five years to be of service. You can be of service right now. And I attribute my not relapsing to service work. And uh, that's kind of what led me to working with special needs people. I've been teaching for many years neurotypical students. Is that um, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here. How, how you used West African rhythms to, well, you know, you, specifically I, for, for I, 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 I use rhythms primarily for cognitive development. And so I'll use exercises where the student will see the exercise, they'll hear the exercise and they'll feel it as they touch the drum. So it's multi-sensory. And it's that multisensory exercise that produces the cognitive development. And that's primarily what I'm focused in on. Um, I, use a, I use West African rhythms to use uh, for autistic students that are less impacted. I also use the drum set. Uh, teach, I'm one of the few people I believe in the country that teaches drum set online to autistic individuals. Um, so, Primarily what I'm doing is I'm using a method called call and response. So I'll use phonics and call and response. And we work with very short phrases and then we gradually develop those phrases. And rather than counting for quarter notes, it'll be slice for eighth notes, pizza for 16th notes, pepperoni. So I'll use those kind of phrases with those phonics for each long phrases. And I found that to be pretty effective. I'm, I'm curious, you, you mentioned earlier in the show, uh, Stephen, or when we chatted on the phone, you mentioned that, you know, you had, you had worked as a, as a forest monk in, in Thailand. Uh, what, what led you to, to do that? And was there anything about that experience that helped you become a better musician or a better educator? Yes. Well, you know, I, I became a monk, uh, kind of by accident. What happened was, is that I was a high school dropout. I didn't go to high school. And uh, when I, I decided that I was going to go get a college degree in humanities, 
And I had a lot of anxiety uh, surrounding going back to school because I, I didn't go to school. Um, and I started meditating with these monks about t uh, 25, 30 miles outside of Seattle on weekends to help address that anxiety. And they said, well, look, you really need to take it to the next level. And that's what took me to Thailand. And uh, so I was a forest monk in Thailand. And I guess uh, one of the main takeaways from that experience was uh, the working with the breath and mindfulness. And that's something that I use in my own musical practice and with my students as well. We routinely take breaks to work on the breath, much like I guess the doctor mentioned earlier. I want to hear more about your work, Stephen, and also uh, with the work that you do with your patients, uh, Andrew, but we're just about ready to go to break. Don't go away. We'll be right back with lots more. Hi, welcome back to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. Dr. Rossetti, I have a question for you. I was wondering, since you run music therapy programs in several countries around the world, if you've noticed any cultural differences in how local populations approach music, whether it's within a therapeutic setting or, or otherwise just in, in, the, in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I'd like to start off by clarifying. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that running the, the programs is, uh, is, is accurate uh, with my Dr. Joey, who is the director of the Louis Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine here at, at uh, Mount Sinai uh, Medical System, we have helped people set up um, music therapy programs, and, and we are, are this we continue to help them develop those programs. So uh, we have helped people set up programs uh, in parts of Asia, uh, South America, Europe. Uh, um, even one one uh, fledgling uh, program in Africa at this point in the Canary Islands, and so um, yes, uh, is there a difference in? in uh, have I seen a difference in, in uh, culturality in the use of music in in that context? Absolutely, but one of the one of the amazing things about music is that it is it is so very much pan cultural, although it is culture specific. And, and of course, uh, that has to be taken into account in clinical practice. Uh, music is ubiquitous. It is something that, that extends to all societies and all, and all peoples. But yeah, absolutely, it's, this is a great point. The most effective music, what, what uh, research tells us, is that the most effective music is what we, what we call patient-preferred or person-preferred music. And it's not rocket science. If there's something that is, that is not part of your culture, whether that be your general culture or your personal or family culture, of course, it's not gonna be as effective as something uh, that is. So uh, yes, very much so. The music in different cultures is culture specific. Hmm. That's absolutely, what's absolutely fascinating. Out. Absolutely fascinating. I, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the role of music in forcing you your body to relax when your body naturally has a tendency to tense up in in difficult situations and i want to go back to you and you you really emphasize uh using the power of sound in difficult situations specifically uh when you were giving birth to to your children um, and you were in a situation where you were waiting for an epidural and the person who was supposed to administer it to you uh, was no longer around or available at the time. How did you use the power of sound to, to go through an experience that I think many women can attest to um, not being very fun, especially without drugs? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the person who's who was about to give the epidural was at the coffee shop. Um, well, there's two things about that experience. Obviously, anyone who's gone through it knows that you access what you can to get through it. So, you know, making very low sounds uh, really helped me through that situation. Um, one thing I didn't talk about in the book was I worked with a woman um, who helped me uh, with hypnosis for relaxation for childbirth. So that was another case of just using sound 
uh, I believe it was even just the sound of her voice to put me in a state where I could set myself up for relaxation in childbirth. And you would think like, oh, how can you relax in that situation? But um, if you, it's sort of like all of life, if you relax through it, uh, you're more open and more great things can happen, right? Um, if you're tensing up, it's going to be difficult. So I talk a bit about that in the book about our desire to control. And I think with singing, we always think like, oh, I need to control my voice. I need to manipulate it in some way when it's more of a surrender and a softening into what is natural for you. Um, so that ties into breathing as well. You know, you get back to diaphragmatic breathing, the breathing we did as babies. Um, so yeah, it's all tied together and, um, yeah, just happy. I don't have to give birth to any more kids. <laughs> One really cool thing that you've done that we haven't talked about yet, Em, is uh, working with Canadian astronaut uh, Chris Hadfield on the first music video in outer space. And he also uh, taught you some powerful lessons on, you know, letting go. Talk to us about what that was like. Sure. I won't go through the whole story because you can read it in the book. And it's fascinating to be a part of recording, you know, partially in space, partially on Earth. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have seen that video now. It's him interpreting Space Oddity, and I helped arrange it for him. And one of the things that happened when it went viral um, was I think people were really taken by his perspective of the Earth from space. So there is a shot in the video where he's looking out the ISS, the Inter International Space Station window, seeing the Earth. And it's there's no effects you know it's just that's what the earth looks like from up there and he taught me that you know seeing the earth as one place you know we're all in this together um you know it's such a powerful sentiment especially right now um and i think i i try to look at things that way like we are all in this together and we're not that different um so that's what I learned from that. And it was an amazing experience to be a part of that. I think you bring up a good point. And with everything going on in the world today, it's, it's exactly that kind of high level thinking that uh, that we need more of. Um, I want to switch gears and, and go back to, to Stephen. You're also the author of a book and we haven't talked about that yet, but uh, you wrote Contemporary Urban Percussion. Um, and that was in part financed by a grant that you received um, to work with incarcerated youth in Los Angeles. Talk to us about what that experience was like and you know, what are some of the things that you highlight in your book that our audience should know about? Well, uh, you know, I, I really enjoy, I, I did that in Los Angeles a number of years ago. And what happened was I received the grant as a result of working with incarcerated youth for two years because they, they found it to be very effective. And what I was doing with them was bucket drumming. And I was using the same phonics method that I mentioned earlier with pizza, pop, and pepperoni. And I also used a, a phonics system for the bucket to turn the bucket into a drum set. And uh, so I, I got the grant for the book and then I, I realized I, I took the book off the market and I use it for a template for when I'm training trainers uh, to do this sort of work, which is something I've done quite a bit of. Um, just found using phonics to be tremendously effective as opposed to counting. You know, I was really fortunate when I was coming up that I had the, um, you know, the opportunity to study with many famous drummers. And one of the things I noticed from studying with world famous jazz drummers was that they all had the innate ability to sing everything they played on the drums, which goes back to the breath too, because we don't normally think of drumming and breathing in the same capacity we would with saxophone or singing. And so that's kind of what influenced my work was, you know, working with all these great drummers. I mean, I, I worked with, uh, I studied rather for one year with uh, Ed Shaughnessy, who was the drummer on The Tonight Show for many years. And he had me sing everything. And uh, so that's something that I use, you know, particularly when I'm working with uh, students who aren't as impacted with West African rhythms, we use phonics that correlate to the different sounds on the djembe, for example. Talk to us about how you use other techniques like positive reinforcement or marrying the student to create a rapport with them. Sure. Um, when I'm working with a special needs student, 
my ability to reach them is largely contingent on developing rapport. So what I'll do is when I sit down with a student, even if I've been working with them for a while, I'll, I'll, I'll try to gauge their, their body language uh, and, and I'll try to, for example, mirror their, their body movements as a way of establishing rapport. Because if a student is speaking slowly and I come in like I've just had an espresso, it's gonna be harder to develop that rapport to get them to work through the exercises. So it's, it, I work a lot with mirroring. If they're shaking uh, a shaker a certain manner, I'll do it in the same way. And for some reason that really, really helps because I think in some ways that sends them the message that this person's on my team. That's very profound. Now, Stephen, you do work with students uh, all across the continent. Where can our viewers find you? Where can we get a copy of your book and where can we learn more about your workshops and other resources? Um, the best place to go is to uh, specialneedsmusic.com and that explains all the different you know, methods that I'm teaching and, uh, and I'm teaching, you know, piano, drum set, uh, West African drumming. And I'm also using another protocol where I just use rhythms for cognitive development. What a wonderful resource and how great to know that uh, students don't need to be in a particular geographic area to, to benefit from your expertise and wisdom. Thank you so much uh, for sharing, Stephen. Uh, we just have a few more minutes left until the end of our time together tonight. Andrew, I wanted to go to you and see if you had um, quickly any sort of interesting projects that you wanted to highlight and also where can we find you and learn more about your work, benefit from your programs. Oh, sure. Uh, so projects. Well, we are we are uh, as a department uh, here at the Armstrong Center for Music and Medicine. We are constantly engaged in clinical research. Um, right now, we have seven uh, internal review board uh, clinical trials um, that are that are ongoing. We have uh, at this point the department probably uh, I'd say close to twenty clinical studies published. And um, I just uh, finished writing up a couple of articles for two studies that are uh, about something we call environmental music therapy, which is uh, using music to uh, transform a patient's perception of the hospital space, the environment in and of itself. Um, you can reach us actually uh, quite easily if, if you were to, uh, to Google uh, music and medicine, or for music and medicine, you would come up with uh, our, our website, the Facebook page. And uh, the website is a, actually a great place to find out more about the department and more about the work we do. Wonderful to hear, Andrew, about the work that you do and that such a modality exists. As I mentioned earlier on in the show, many of us who are researching the topic didn't even know about it, and yet it, it brings about so many great benefits. Now, finally, I want to go back to M. M. Greiner, who is the author of The Healing Power of Singing, Raise Your Voice, Change Your Life. Where can we get a copy of your book, and where can our audience find out more about the things that you're up to? Thank you. Um, you can go to my website, mgriner, E-M-M-G-R-Y-N-E-R.com. You can get the book there. You can also find out about things that I'm doing there. Uh, your local bookstore will have the book. You might have to get them to order it. Um, and I encourage you to use your local bookstore above the Amazon option. But if you have to go that way, it's there too. And you were in Nashville uh, recently. Where, when will we be able to hear some of that music? I'm not sure. It's just in the works. Um, so ho hopefully by next year. Okay. Well, we look we look forward to that, and uh, we can go visit uh, your website anytime to learn more about uh, what you're up to. Finally, uh, one last question for Stephen, really quickly: What's your favorite song to lift you out of a slump? Well, I think everyone uh, should check out "A Love Supreme" by John Coltrane. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. I, I wanna take this time to thank all of you for joining us and for sharing your wisdom, your expertise and your experience and talking about how we can use the healing power of music in our everyday lives, no matter what walk of life or how terrible we may be at singing in the shower, we can all benefit from the therapeutic 
uh, nature of music. If you're joining us tonight, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again, same time and place next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Have a wonderful night.